Hello, this is the fifth lesson in the base E investigations. I want to take you right down to uh, a table here. It's talking about the E um, evaluations that we're going to look at. But first they have us do a really cool thing. They give us, uh, this should look familiar from our last lesson, 1 plus 1 over x raised to the x. Okay. Now they're going to say, let's make x equal to 1. So we plug that in there, 1 plus 1 over 1 would be 2, raised to the first would be 2. Now what happens if that increases? So it's 1 plus 1 tenth raised to the 10, that would be 1.1 raised to the 10, we get 2.5937 blah blah blah. Let's watch for a pattern here. What's going to happen as this x value gets increasingly big, well let's just play with this, 1 plus 1 divided by 100 this time raised to the 100 equals 2.704813 that's far enough okay now if we go 1 whoops parentheses 1 plus 1 over 1,000. So we're increasing x without bound, raising it to the 1,000. 2.16923, you can get that filled in. Now we go to 10,000. What are we getting ever so close to? This should look like when we were working with the asymptotes um, and increasing our values to see what asymptote we were getting close to. That one is two point. 718145. Just going to keep putting them in there. You pause the video. As needed to copy these down. We're at 100,000 now. should be seeing something that we're getting closer and closer to here. What number? You can see the pattern right here on my screen. Now it's one plus one millionth. See the pattern of what you're getting closer and closer to. Last one. 10 million. So it'll be 1 plus 10 millionth. Raise to the 10 millionth. Okay, there we go. Now, they ask you next to go on your calculator and find the value of E. Okay? So, on the calculator, if you look, we go second, LN, and there's E. Put it to the first power. Look at what you get there. Go ahead and copy that entire number down right here on 1D. So, question is, what happens to the value of 1 plus 1 over x as x increases without bound? Okay, so as it increased without bound, it became 1 plus 
one half, it was one and a half. One plus a tenth was one and a tenth. One plus one over a hundredth was one and a hundredth. This was before we raised it. So it's getting ever so close to one. What happens to the value when we raise it to the power? Look up here and tell me what the trend is. What's it getting closer and closer to without bound? Okay. What do you think the connection is between 1 plus 1 over x raised to the x and the number e? Okay. As the x increases with bound, the value of these comes closer and closer to what? Okay, and I, I hope that you're seeing that it's that value of E. Okay. So now, the number E is defined as the value of 1 plus 1 over x raised to the x. As x increases without bound, as you saw earlier, the decimal form of e is approximately this. So e is an irrational number, it's just like pi, whose actual decimal value neither repeats nor terminates. Like any other positive real number, e can be used as the base of an exponential function. So now we see e as the base. So if we have the graph f of x equals e to the x, we can come over and we can actually plot this. Okay? Without graphing, explain how the graph f of x equals e x compares to the graph of f of x or g of x equals 2 to the x and 3 to the x. We'll think of the value g to the x equals 2 to the x, h to the x equals 3 to the x, and e to the x is very, very close to 2.7182 2.7182818828 raised to the x. So what could you tell me about the curve of this graph compared to the curves of these? If you need to, go up and plot these. I want in your own words what this does. Where this graph lays compared to these two. Okay. Now, if we have a plus 3 here, what do you think it will do as far as the asymptotes? Graph each exponential. First graph the parent function. The, first the graph the parent function e to the x, which I believe this is e to the x. Okay, yeah, it's shown at the right. The graph of g to the x is translated how many units in which direction? This is the same hk format, so what is that, an h or a k? Hopefully you said that it's an h, so it would be three units to the left. So take this, what I call the vertex, move it three units to the left, and redraw that graph. Okay, now in this one, here's the parent function. Now we have an a value, so that's a shrink, and we have a k value. So first thing you're going to do is you're going to move this asymptote up one, Now normally that would move this up one. Okay. Which it actually still does. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting that. That it's multiplied by that, so it will still cross one above the asymptote. But now all of the other points have a shrink of one half. So all the distance here is going to shrink. It'll come over and be a lot lower, come up and be a lot further out. Okay? Actually, it comes higher and further out because it shrinks down to the axis. And here's why. One half times uh, each of these, that's a factor of a half. So that's why it 
brings it out wider. Okay? Questions? Make sure and plug those values in. Um, just find points at which it crosses and just take half of that. Okay? Uh, the stretch or shrink is one half. The uh, K value is that it's shifting up one. Without graphing, describe how the graph e to the 3 of x compares to the graph of e to the x. Think of our last unit. That is a horizontal something. Go back to the last unit and watch that if you need to. Horizontal is different from vertical. Okay? So instead of, of being that whole number, you're going to use it as a fraction. Okay, recall that the principal P is invested in an account. Remember this from yesterday. So now, what we say is, consider what happens if the compounding periods increase. Compounding periods increase without bound. Well, if they increase without bound, then this shows you that as increases without bound, so does M. So we end up with this situation. In other words, we've taken the N and replaced it because it's no longer number of times, it's without bound. So we're going to go M. As the M continues to increase without bound, this becomes the definition of Euler's number, or E, and then we still have it raised to the rate times the time. Okay? So when interest is compounded continuously, the effective rate would be e to the r minus 1. Okay? Because you're still doing the same thing as you've done before, but that's a handy one to remember for effective rate. Okay. Find the effective rate. All that we need to do is look for our rate. That's 2.5%, so it becomes 0.025. And we just take Euler's number, E, remember it is on here, the way that you do it is you go second ln raised to the 0 0.025 minus 1. And there's our effective rate. Go ahead and write it down. You can round it to five decimal places. So 0 0.02531, that's a five, so round that up to a two. Okay. Find the amount after five years. So we want A to five years. Now we plug in our principal. His principal amount is $2,700. So we'd go 2,700 times E to the point 0.025, that's our rate, times 5. Okay? So 2,700. I'm going to try and fit that calculator on there so you can see it. 2,700 E raised to the 0 0.025 times 5. There we go. There's the amount of money that he's going to get. Copy it right off of there. Put the answer here. Now that's an approximate because remember E is an irrational number. Um, and I, It's very accurate approximate but we've got to round it. And now down here in the blank make sure to put the dollar symbol with it. Okay. Tomorrow in class, we'll go over these practice. Why does the variable n not appear in the formula? P equals RT. Well, what did n represent? Go back and look at that. The E is for continuously compounded interest. So think about what the n represented and explain why we wouldn't have it. Okay, we'll do the practice in class tomorrow. Come with questions over this. Thank you.